over the years, we've set up this um, scheme where every single person convicted of a criminal offense gets um, uh, fines, fees, uh, costs, and restitution, um, depending upon the nature of the offense and what year you were convicted. Um, I was convicted uh, the last time in Kitsap County in 2011, where Kitsap County was historically giving out the most of these um, LFOs to people. Um, so when I was convicted of a drug possession charge, for example, I was given about $3,000 in, in LFOs. Um, and when I was finally convicted, I, I had three different cause numbers. So my LFOs were, you know, over six or $7,000. And none of that was restitution to pay an individual victim back. It was all money to fund the court system, to fund my public defender that's constitutionally guaranteed, to fund, uh, you know, the police department, the county clerks, um, you know, and those were the types of uh, LFOs I was given. Um, you know, it, it all depended upon, again, the county that you were convicted in, the year. Um, we've made a lot of progress, and I think Nick will talk about that um, in a little bit. Um, but the way, you know, it impacted my life is that, you know, the interest was accruing while I was in prison. I got out of prison, and the first job I got was at Burger King, and, you know, it was making $9.19 an hour. Um, and at that time, they could only give me up to, I think, 28 or 30 hours a week because if they gave me more, they'd have to give me health insurance because it was right when the Affordable Care Act came. So literally $9.19 an hour, 30 hours a week, I get released, I have two kids, and then they start garnishing my Burger King paycheck, the county clerk did, um, to, to pay back these, these LFOs. That led to housing instability. I actually um, was studying for the law school admission test while I was homeless um, and had to you know, send my children who I had just left um, being separated from for two years in prison, had to send them to live with relatives so I could couch surf. And that is when I was um, early in my reentry. Um, and but I was committed because during the time they were garnishing my paycheck, I remember working at Burger King and, you know, some of my coworkers were still partially in the life. And I was thinking to myself, you know, maybe I should just sell drugs this time, but not use them because then maybe I can afford shoes for my kids. And the thoughts of that, when I was hanging on to my recovery from addiction, um, the thoughts of that is what really made me go to law school because I didn't see a way out because people wouldn't give me a job because of my criminal history but I didn't have enough money to provide for my kids. And I was so afraid to leave them again and to go back to prison. That is really what motivated me to go to law school and find a way out of this system. Um, and so you guys know, you know a lot of the story. I went to law school, um, I've been working on LFOs and, and now I have the honor of shepherding the Civil Survival Project in my day job where we have attorneys that are helping individuals with LFO relief. Um, but in my legislative hat, really want to make more progress. I don't think that the, um, you, you know, access, when we think about access to justice, unless you know somebody who knows somebody and there's not enough attorneys to help everybody, um, doing this one-off uh, way is really ineffective and we need mass relief. And so we need to continue to work on broad sweeping relief through legislative action. Um, and I'm just really grateful for all of my colleagues here on this call. Every single person on this Zoom has a stake in this and it has a voice and, and we need you um, to make this happen. And so, um, you know, it, it impacts our reentry, um, not only from the garnishment and the payment, but also you have to pay these off before you can ever vacate your criminal record. And vacating your criminal record will help you, will help us, you know, get more access to things that we need, like better employment opportunities. Um, still, you know, the criminal record is the proxy for discrimination, for lawful discrimination. Um, we've made some progress, but definitely not enough when it comes to employment, when it comes to housing. Um, you know, still today, I think I laugh because I'm a state legislator and attorney. I fought to the Supreme Court to become an attorney. They said I had a good character and fitness, and I still can't you know, chaperone my, my son just graduated from high school. I never got to go on a field trip with him. 
I can't, um, you know, take my niece and nephew. I, I still have a stepdaughter who's in school. You know, all of these ways that we are discriminated against. Um, so many people I know can't get life insurance. Fortunately, I've been able to fly under the radar. I thought that would be funny if I'm a state legislator and they wouldn't give me my life insurance, but it didn't come up yet. Um, but, you know, people are just um, kept out of so many different opportunities and things that we need to feel like we're part of the community, to actually take care of our families um, with a criminal record. And the LFOs have to be taken care of before you can take care of your criminal record. It's, it's not justice, um, uh, you know, if it's not accessible to poor people, then it's not just or fair. And so, you know, my vision and my hope, uh, what I've told Antonio, who's on the Zoom, and I don't see his face, but we had coffee recently. He's a wonderful um, uh, staff member of, of Columbia Legal Services. I told him the other day when we had coffee, like my vision and my hope is that we abolish all LFOs in the state um, and I hate that we have to work in incremental ways because of the nature of the legislature, but I think House Bill 1412 is a good step um, in bringing more justice to our community. And I'm committed to not stopping there for as long as I hold a seat in the state legislature. I think I will have an LFO bill every single year um, until we reach the ultimate goal of getting money out of this criminal legal system. So. Thank you all for joining. Thank you for being a part of this movement and this fight. And I will turn it back over to Kelly. Thank you, Representative Simmons. So next we're gonna play two uh, videos. It's actually testimony um, from the hearing. Uh, we have some testimony from Professor Harris and Professor Martin that have done a lot of research on this area just to kind of give us some history and some research and facts around LFOs in our state. So stand by and we'll test my um, screen sharing and video skills here. Hold on just a second. Guys for that. Uh, my name is Alexis Harris. I am a professor for identification purposes only. I am a professor of sociology at the University of Washington. Um, I've researched monetary sanctions in Seattle and nationally for the past 13 years, and I'm the author of a book called A Pound of Flesh, Monetary Sanctions as a Punishment for the Poor, which based, was based on research across five counties here in Washington state. Um, just to be real, we're, real brief, I, I want us to think about the system of monetary sanctions, which uh, LFO can sit within. There are a lot of buckets of costs that people are charged upon sentencing, and also just in general with entanglement with the criminal legal system. So there's restitution, but there are also fines that people face. There are criminal justice user fees that people face. There's the 12% uh, interest that people face, and then also payment related costs and financing costs. What I want to do really quickly is highlight three sort of buckets of the research that I've is the video not showing showing no it's not okay let me try again there you can, go can you see it now yeah. okay done um in general, a summary from my book is that there is no other population as disadvantaged pre and post conviction uh, in the United States uh, other than uh, uh, criminal justice uh, felons. Um, and disproportionately African American, Native American, and Latino uh, men who encounter the criminal legal system. Um, this is a particularly egregious practice and impedes the process of rehabilitation and assistance. Um, in my work, I use the term perfect to describe the extent to which this process perfectly labels, stigmatizes, and financially burdens and imposes further legal consequences to poor people simply because they have no ability to pay. Uh, this is a direct intervention that you as policymakers have created to, and in, in a consequence, it extracts wealth from individuals and also their communities. Um, but you have chosen to apply this to individuals. The system perfectly sorts already marginalized and further cements them to lives of inequality. So that's generally my book and there's a lot of empirical evidence that supports those claims. 
Um, but the second study is something I've done recently with a colleague, Frank Edwards, uh, for Seattle Municipal Court. Uh, and this analysis speaks to the debt that people carry in general within our state. Um, and it's really important to highlight how differently people of color carry this debt burden. We found that people sentenced to criminal traffic cases, so three things. People sentenced to criminal traffic cases tended to have LFO accounts open for longer periods of time compared to other types of cases in our state. For each class of case, black men and women were significantly more likely than their peers to be sentenced to incarceration through a Washington State Superior Court following both a paid and unpaid Seattle Municipal Court legal financial obligation. What does that mean? So people are getting traffic tickets within muni courts and then there's a downstream consequences where for whatever reason, non-payment, driving with license suspended, they receive sentences or have a higher likelihood of receiving sentences in a Washington State Superior Court. Um, people of color also have a higher likelihood than white people to be charged with a driving with a license suspended in the third degree following an SMC, a Seattle Municipal Court LFO sentence. And this is especially pronounced for black drivers. So that was the second bucket of research. The third bucket of research is what we call debtor's blocks. We're interested in the amount of debt that individuals and their families carry, but we also wanted to statistically map to see if we could find neighborhoods that disproportionately carry this burden of debt, and we have across Washington state. We observed that you can, looking at census tract data, this was based on using administrative office of the courts data, you can identify neighborhoods across Washington that disproportionately carry this debt burden. And higher poverty neighborhoods, already impoverished neighborhoods, have tend to have a higher per capita LFO debt burden. Um, and LFOs are associated with increases in future poverty rates. So again, this purposeful sentencing practice, in addition to incarceration and everything else people go through, right, actually exacerbates poverty in our state for poor people and people of color. Well, Professor, that's about four minutes. Are you basically done, I hope? Um, I, I have a summary right here that I Let's can hear the summary. Okay. The summary is that I was told I had five minutes. So sorry. Um, that um, there are multiple aims of this unique punishment option. It's not a collateral consequence. It's a purposeful one. It's a punishment. It's aimed to hold people accountable in the RCW, but it's also a revenue generation uh, process, right? And that really uh, undermines the legitimacy of our criminal legal system when people feel that they're being uh, policed uh, for fines and fees. Um, so it's a two-tiered system of justice, one for poor people, one for wealthy people. If you're poor in the system, you can't get out. Um, there's more intense surveillance and control, and there's a host of related consequences. Um, and it really blocks people's abilities to be healthy in their future. And I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. That's probably my a hard stop at 1030 myself, so I apologize. Okay, we have one more. Professor Karen Martin, please. Hi, thank you. I am a professor in the School of Public Policy and Governance at the University of Washington, and I've done some work with Alexis. And I'm going, do I have four minutes or five minutes? I'm going to set my own timer. Uh, if, I, if I cheated you, well, let's say five, and we'll do the same okay. for group of people right. on the other side of the bill. Okay. Go ahead. Sounds good. So I'm going to start your time now. Okay, I'm going to focus on two um, main topics. One is I've done research nationally for about 12 years. And then since I moved here in 2017, I've been focusing in Washington as well. And one of the things I'd like to talk to you about is the LFO reconsideration day that Pierce County held in 2019. And that a number of counties in Washington are now considering. The LFO reconsideration day allowed people who had LFO debt to come in on a specific day to see if they could have their what they owed either waived or reduced. Um, and they we ended up having about 450 people that, that I'm going to report on. And so I just want to tell you about the impact of that day. So people, the um, lots of volunteers came together, judges, clerks, attorneys, shepherded everybody through the, the, the day. Everybody's file was pulled ahead of time. Decisions were made very quickly. So that day we had about 56% of people were white, 24% were black, just to give you a sense of the demographic. Graphics. We also found that black residents have been paying almost double the amount of white residents per capita. Um, most of the people who responded to our survey that day were the main earners in their household. Most of them are renters with an annual income of less than $15,000 a year. We asked people about the consequences for not being able to pay what they owe. 78% had experienced an increase in what they owed. More than 6 in 10 had previously had their driver's license suspended, a third had spent time in jail, and this is because of what they owed to the courts, because of unpaid LFOs, spending time in jail, suspended license, increase in what they owed. We also asked people what having unpaid LFOs made difficult or impossible for them, 
And it really stood out to us that more than half struggled with the basics. They struggled with getting food. They struggled with getting shelter. They struggled with transportation. 65% couldn't pay their rent or mortgage. 60% struggled to buy groceries. 60% struggled to pay for gas, bus fare, et cetera. So when we're talking about LFO debt, it directly impacts the basics of people being able to survive. The, um, just to give you a sense of the scale of what happened that day, the municipal court waived about 96% of what they, we started with that day. So they reduced about $95,000 was reduced or waived. The district court reduced or waived about $170,000, which was 86%. And then the superior court, they waived about $2.3 million, which was only 42%, but that is because there's a lot of mandatory um, payments that must be made if you have a superior court case. I think it's really important. You're going to hear from people who owe money and in the word, let, I will, you know, happy let them speak for themselves. The day that we were there, people said things like, this is a blessing in my journey to cleaning up my past and becoming a more productive member of society. It's truly given me a, a better outlook on being more responsible and arranging to pay my fines on time. I thank the courts. Um, some people talked about, you know, having done something when they were younger and trying to move on and it seems pointless and to be able to just be relieved of this debt was really spurred them on in there mission. Um, that was bucket one. Bucket two is I've done a recent peer-reviewed analysis of restitution. And what is really interesting to me about this study is we asked people, a nationally representative sample, do we just ask them what they think restitution is? And it was very strong and clear finding was that people believe that restitution is was what I call direct restitution. That restitution consists of a person who commits a crime, pays the victim or victims back for the harm of that crime. So it is very clear, direct correspondence between the person who commits the crime and the victim. And we also ask for support, and that is what people want restitution to be. Now, why this is important is because what restitution functionally is, is, a, is very different. It functions as a tax. We have, a, we have mandatory penalty assessments. We have crime victim assessment fees. P anybody convicted of any offense pays this fund into these funds that's institutionally kind of uh, mediated and then can go to victims. The issue is that, uh, now I have about 50 seconds left, is that what I'm finding in my research is that there's public support for the type of, of restitution that tends to make a lot of sense to people. And there's not a lot of public support for doing something like paying back an insurance company for a long period of time or paying money that you don't have or paying or somebody paying kind of into a fund, even though their crime doesn't necessarily have a, a known victim. So I will end there to, to respect the time. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you. Um, I know it's kind of a long, almost 10 minutes of video, but I think it was important and provided a good foundation. Um, we are gonna take a quick five minute break. We have, um, we do have an interpreter who's in with us and um, there's only one. So we wanted to make sure that we give them a break every 30 minutes. So we're gonna take a quick five minute break um, and we will resume um, at 5.32. Okay, so welcome back everybody. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, let me see, we have Nick Allen up next. Nick, if you find you. There you are. Um, Nick, if you wanna introduce yourself and then I'm controlling the PowerPoint slide. So if you wanna let me know uh, when to show my screen and when to move the slides forward. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. All right. Well, thanks, Ed. Thanks, everyone, for joining uh, this uh, this town hall today. Um, I'm going to give you um, a little bit of history about LFO advocacy over the last 10 years or so in, in Washington um, with a focus on uh, legislative reforms. Um, this is, again, this is the a, a about a 10-minute abbreviated version, so please uh, forgive me if I, if I don't cover it everything or leave out individuals or organizations that have been a part of this work. And um, I, I say that because there's just been so many groups, organizations uh, that have uh, contributed to this uh, advocacy over the last several years, many of whom I know are on this call and have done uh, incredible work. Um, I'd say, you know, um, and this is, go to slide, uh, slide two. Um, 
overall uh, LFO reform advocacy has, has been about, I'd say, a, a, a nearly two decade struggle with um, people who have been ordered to pay LFOs really experiencing the impact of these debts ever since they were first introduced into, um, uh, into sentencing. Uh, when the use of LFOs began to increase in the late 90s, early 2000s, there were some public defenders who began bringing challenges to, uh, to highlight constitutional violations associated with LFOs and other injustices faced uh, by people ordered to, to pay them. Um, but outside of that, momentum and awareness really wasn't there and didn't begin to grow until really the, the mid to late 2000s. Um, and, and there's been a number of successes in the, in the last 10 to 15 years uh, to the point where I think, you know, Washington's gone from being a regular example of a, of a state whose LFO scheme has been uh, highlighted as being one of the worst in the country to one that's shifting in a different direction, beginning to acknowledge some of the injustices associated with LFOs and the scheme we have here in Washington state uh, with the goal of bringing about changes both uh, through the courts and the legislature. Um, but despite that progress, we still have a lot of work to be done as uh, Representative Simmons mentioned. Um, I'll take you through some of that progress before turning it over to some of our other panelists to talk about what lies ahead in, um, in the immediate future. So we'll go to slide three. Um, this is a advocacy timeline for LFOs um, from the past 13 years that highlights some of the key steps of uh, advocacy research that's occurred during um, that time to address um, LFOs in, in, in Washington state the awful system we have, the impact they have here, um, particularly um, on uh, people and communities living in poverty and communities of color. Now, like I mentioned earlier, this is an abbreviated version, so there's a lot more advocacy efforts that are not included here, um, some of which we'll touch on. Um, this gives you a basic sense of just how long this effort's been going on and how much time and energy has been spent uh, to reform our LFO system uh, in Washington. Go to the next slide. Uh, as, as, as I mentioned earlier, um, in the early 2000s, LFOs really weren't on the radar for, uh, for most folks. Uh, people who represented individuals with, uh, with LFOs and of course people with LFOs um, always knew of the harms that were being created by this system. But for a long period of time, a lot of folks weren't listening. Um, they weren't necessarily on, on policymakers' radar, um, at least with regards to the negative impact that they were having on people being convicted of offenses. Um, in that respect, they were actually continuing to increase the number of LFOs uh, at that time and the amounts that were imposed. Um, the courts were also issuing opinions during this time, but also, also you know, during that time, the, the results of, often were not favorable. So in other words, um, LFOs and their harmful impacts were not yet a statewide issue. Um, but that all began to change um, between about 2007 and, and 2009. And I'll point to a couple of things that happened during that time. First, you know, um, community members, legal advocates and others began pointing out some of the co collateral consequences of legal financial obligations, primarily that um, you know, people with felony convictions who were ordered to pay LFOs were denied the opportunity to restore their right to vote after release if they hadn't paid off their LFOs in full. Um, as a result, there was a significant portion of the um, uh, Washington state population um, that was permanently disenfranchised because they would never be able to pay off their legal financial obligations. And this was especially pronounced uh, in the black community and other communities of color where those percentages, you know, rose uh, to um, really ridiculous levels uh, in terms of disenfranchisement because of, um, of LFOs and, and how they were tied into the right to vote. Um, eventually this was litigated all the way up to the state Supreme Court. There was a case, uh, Madison v. State, where the court ruled against the uh, petitioners and upheld the legislative scheme that denied rights, um, the, the voting rights to, to folks who lacked the ability to pay. But uh, what this decision resulted in is really the first legislative change 
to address LFOs in Washington in, in a positive direction. Not the absolute first, but really on a, on a statewide level, a, a bill that was on uh, folks' radar. Because the court didn't address this injustice, um, advocates worked to make this change in the legislature. And in 2009, House Bill 1517 uh, passed. And that provided people who still owed LFOs with the provisional right to vote. So if you still owed LFOs, you could register to vote. You would have that right to vote if you were uh, no longer on DOC uh, supervision. Uh, but there were um, conditions placed on that. If you missed payments, I think it was three over the course of a year, that right could be revoked. If you willfully failed to pay, that right could be revoked. So really no full restoration of voting rights until um, the LFOs were paid in full. I'll briefly just state that um, this was the goal for the next 12 years, but um, it's going to start going to final session right now. Um, I'll take that. It's actually sponsored by Representative C. Wiggins. So, total confinement, have that full voting right uh, restored um, uh, so long as they are uh, no longer serving a term of, uh, of total confinement. Um, and around that same time, uh, I was told the sound isn't coming in very well. Is that better? Okay. Um, around the same time, this is another kind of uh, benchmark in the um, in LFO uh, reform. The Washington State uh, Minority and Justice Commission began expressing some interest in LFOs, and that uh, body commissioned a study which was conducted by doctors Alexis Harris, who you saw in the video, and uh, Catherine Beckett at the University of Washington. And this study was Assessment and Consequences of Legal Financial Obligations in Washington State, was one of the first in the country to look at LFOs and their impacts. And there were a number of key takeaways from this report, and really for the first time, data showing how harmful this system uh, was to people and um, their families uh, who were receiving legal financial obligations. Um, next slide. Um, oh, actually, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Go back one. So we're still talking about uh, 2010 to 2013 in that area where um, the advocacy uh, broadened. Um, you know, during this time, one of the other issues that really became universally identified in addition to the, to the voting issue uh, that was one of the first that came up was the interest rate on legal financial obligations. So at the time, uh, the interest rate on all LFOs was 12% per year from the date of judgment, one of the highest rates in the country. So people, what we saw was people with LFOs were regularly going um, into prison with one or $2,000 in legal financial obligations. But because of that interest rate coming up, uh, coming out with amounts that had doubled or tripled uh, upon release. And uh, as a result, there was some legislative efforts in 2011 to uh, begin to address the interest rate. It wasn't lowered. It wasn't addressed at the time of sentencing. But instead, there was a bill, uh, uh, Senate Bill 5423, that passed and increased opportunities for people to get relief from interest on non-restitution, so costs, fees, and fines, uh, that it accrued on their legal financial obligations. Now, I will say, while it was one of the first steps in addressing uh, interest and addressing LFOs, it wasn't necessarily comprehensive, uh, nor was it the most effective or useful legislative change. When you look at the practical, uh, the, the, the provisions of the, um, of the bill, it wasn't really practical. Um, it, it, it was still uh, placed a lot of uh, burden on the individual with legal financial obligations uh, to go through a number of steps in order to get that relief. Um, but it was a step in the right direction. Um, during this time, uh, Washington also began to become exposed as having a particularly bad LFO scheme on a national level. There were several national reports that were issued during this time, local reports highlighting how Washington's system works to criminalize poverty. Um, and all of this work really started to broaden the scope of what LFO reform could look like. Um, due to the research, the reports, the budding legal and legislative advocacy, 
the budding community advocacy, it really became apparent that our LFO laws collectively created um, a major barrier to successful reentry, that they prevented people with criminal convictions from really having opportunities for second chances, from being able to put uh, the, the criminal conviction in the past and, and, and move on be, beyond that. And um, those problems that resulted really centered around uh, four or five issues. One, which I've discussed, the high interest rate, uh, another one, vague definitions of things like ability to pay and indigence, which are really important to waiver of legal financial obligations and whether or not sanctions will be imposed. And this resulted in high amounts of discretionary costs being imposed by the courts. Um, the use of debtors prisons, people being jailed for failing to pay legal financial obligations, and the overall lack of post-conviction relief options, such as uh, waiver after the fact, conversion of LFOs to um, community service. And so with those um, ideas in mind, there was really a, um, uh, 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 a push. We started to see more outreach and education around LFOs. This was true in the legal community where there were education efforts among and to judges, the defense community, prosecutors about the impacts of legal financial obligations. A lot of work being done by people with LFOs to do the education work, to inform policymakers uh, about, the L about LFOs and nuances in the law. Um, and then people, um, you know, and their families doing, uh, sharing stories about how they could not get out from under these debts, despite their, uh, their best efforts because of the way the law was set up. Um, we started seeing uh, increased advocacy on the legal side of things, lawsuits being filed. Um, challenging practices around the state. And there was a, a lawsuit that was filed by um, uh, the ACLU uh, on a, a debtor's prison issue. There was a lawsuit filed by um, uh, Northwest Justice Project. There was this case, State v. Blazina, where the um, uh, Washington Supreme Court said that, you know, before imposing discretionary costs, the court had to do an individualized inquiry into ability to pay, um, which, you know, narrowed the uh, uh, how LFOs could um, uh, be imposed. Um, and um, edu general education outreach was also uh, occurring during this time. Um, and this led to uh, a really strong effort to focus on comprehensive reform uh, around LFOs, which started in 2014. And then uh, by 2018, led to the passage of House Bill 1783. Um, that passed um, uh, uh, after five years of efforts. And, and um, I think what's important is, is just um, what drove that success. I think persistence was key. Coalitions were working together among legal advocates, community advocates, researchers um, to push a comprehensive bill. Um, but I also think... That support. I really believe that this, in large part, was the reason that um, the LFO legislation 1783. Um, got over the um, over the hump. Um, you know, uh, it's one thing to have lawyers telling their experiences about clients and discuss the law on LFOs. It's another to hear about the personal experiences of people with LFOs, how folks are choosing to, uh, between paying LFOs or paying for food or rent, getting arrested to pay, uh, for failing to pay LFOs, really having no options for relief and realizing this will be a lifelong burden uh, that can end any hopes of a uh, successful reentry, and, and the same I think is needed as we go into um, to 2022. I won't, for the sake of time, get deep into what 1783 did, um, but it really, you know, uh, in general, eliminated the 12% interest rate on non-restitution, created some new indigency standards, increased opportunities for conversion to community service and address some mandatory LFOs that courts previously had to impose regardless of a person's um, indigence or ability to pay. Um, but as good as 1783 was, is only a, a first step. 
is not solved all of the problems associated with Washington's LFO systems, as, as Tara uh, uh, mentioned. Um, and, and, and that's due, you know, in, in large part to the nature of the legislature, where compromise is usually going to be a part of um, the passage of every bill. Um, but there still remain significant uh, additional legislative changes that are needed to eliminate all of the harms that LFOs create, um, particularly for those who, who lack the ability to pay. Um, we could move on to uh, the next slide. Um, and I'll... So, you know, after 1783 passed, what um, people with legal financial obligations, community advocates were saying is there was a lot that was left out of this bill. And we need to come back at some point and push for uh, the second phase of, uh, of legal financial obligation reform. And, and that's where we're at now. And what really opened the door for that opportunity to occur is that um, there was a legislative criminal uh, sentencing task force that was convened by the legislature that started back in uh, uh, 2019. And uh, it's looking at sentencing in Washington state. And one of the issues that that task force has chosen to take up as a result of um, you know, looking at sentencing reform is legal financial obligations. And several recommendations uh, came out of that criminal justice, uh, justice task force uh, around LFOs all of them related to those um, uh, gaps, those provisions that were not included in 1783 with a couple of others that were added. And um, that, those recommendations were turned into a, um, uh, were drafted into a bill which Representative Simmons uh, uh, sponsored and was introduced last year, House Bill 1412. I'm going to turn it over to uh, our other speakers to talk about the details of 1412 and what else is needed. Um, but overall, I think it's just really important to remember what drove success um, with the passage of 1783 and strategizing on what's necessary for passage of uh, a 1412. So thanks for the time. I think we're going to hand it over to Prachi now. I'll stop sharing for just a second there. Prachi, are you ready? And do you want me to share the slides? You want to introduce yourself first? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Kelly. If you could continue to share the slide. I think we're on slide number nine. OK. And did you want to introduce yourself real quick? Sure, sure, absolutely. So my name is Prachi Dave. I'm the Policy and Advocacy Director at the Public Defender Association and work very closely with the Civil Survival Project, which has been a project at the Public Defender Association for a bit of time now, but is an amazing organization that started independently and works, of course, by um, and for people who are impacted by the systems we are talking about right now. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and go back to screen sharing. Perfect. So just building from uh, very quickly, building on what it is that Nick had to say about, you know, the history of LFO work in the state of Washington, what I think has been, and I think we all agree has been incredibly apparent, has been that we really just need to build on the individual experiences of people um, who are facing financial hardship, but who are also required by the system to pay LFOs. And so one of the anchoring pieces of that conversation has been the definition of indigence. And so, as you'll see in this bullet pointed list on HB 1412, which Representative Simmons uh, sponsored during this last session, and hopefully will be pursuing during this upcoming session, a great deal of these reforms are anchored to what has generally been understood for a while now to be very individualized, um, but all encompassing idea of what it is that it means in the state of Washington when it comes to legal financial obligations uh, to be indigent. And so there are certain provisions that we built into 1412 and those provisions were based on previous conversations um, that Nick described in the history of LFO reform. 
And so one of the first one is the waiver, for example, or reduction of restitution owed to entities. And here the distinction is the waiver reduction of restitution owed to entities versus in, in versus individuals. And so the idea being that you know, if you can engage in analysis of whether or not a person can have or has the means to pay restitution to entities, that is a very different analysis from whether or not they have the ability to pay individuals. And in 1412, uh, what we built into the bill as a provision was whether or not a person has the means to pay restitution that is owed to entities that is defined in 1412, and that is an analysis that a court can engage in. Further, uh, in 1783, my, my apologies for the sound here, um, in 17, HB 1783, one of the pieces that um, had not been included was that people who were currently incarcerated were unable to engage in remission efforts, so were unable to seek that kind of relief. That is something that 1412 would address in addition to the remission of fines, which you know is the distinction that we see with respect to LFOs, which is the distinction between costs uh, that we see uh, within kind of the statutory scheme and then fines. And what we want to be able to do is to say, we want courts to engage in an individualized assessment of whether or not a person can pay. That assessment needs to take that uh, person's uh, situation, financial situation into account. And in doing so, that should apply to, you know, costs, it should apply to fines, so on and so forth. And so in 1412, there's really an effort to address the fact that if you can't pay, you don't have the means to pay, you're indigent for the purposes of paying a certain amount of money, you are also indigent uh, for the purposes of paying other amounts of money. And so the remission of fines is one of those pieces. Similarly, again, um, making sure we're anchoring ourselves in this idea of you know, individual um, indigence and that analysis, we wanted to be able to engage in the waiver of the 12% interest rate on restitution. 1412 includes a series of factors that a court can engage in, in terms of analysis to determine whether or not a person um, can you know uh, whether or not the court can waive the 12% interest rate on restitution? That's incredibly important, of course, because you know ideally, if the person is paying in, uh, restitution or paying money towards restitution to an individual, that is where that money should be going. Um, but again, you know, it's important to understand that. So many people who are encompassed and entrenched in the system are indigent, and it's important for us to engage in that particular analysis. Uh, further, you know, the ability for courts to provide um, or have avenues to waive or reduce uh, current mandatory legal financial obligations, including the victim penalty assessment, that's incredibly important uh, for the pieces. Um, or the uh, you know, perspective that Representative Simmons provided us with, which is that a lot of people just simply don't have the money to pay uh, towards their LFOs. Mandatory LFOs are currently unwaivable either at the time of imposition or at the back end. And therefore, people who simply cannot pay don't have access to other relief methods like vacating their convictions, which will then have reverberating effects in their lives moving forward. Um, so in addition, you know, one of the things that HB 1412 addresses are the timelines of the court's collection of LFOs. This is something that has been important just based on conversations with community members, the understanding around the degree to which LFOs tether individuals to the court system and the criminal legal system, and how long should that be the case for? Um, in 1412, the way in which uh, we have crafted the bill or way in which the language reads in the bill is that restitution amounts can be renewed if there is an indication that there is a willful failure to pay. Otherwise, on other amounts, there is a shorter period of time where the courts have jurisdiction over the collection of LFOs. 
And then the last um, item, that is last bullet point around the definition of indigence is really tied into all of these elements, which is that the understanding that indigence encompasses a little bit more or much more than the idea of simply being guided by the federal poverty guidelines. And so making sure that people's various circumstances, including other debts that are owed, their financial circumstances, their personal circumstances, are included when a court makes decisions around uh, the waiver of LFOs or the decision to impose LFOs in the first place. So I think that that summarizes HB 1412. More than happy to answer any questions in the back end. And thank you very much. Thank you, Prachi. Um, we still have Hannah and Tara to go. Um, Hannah, are you, you want to introduce yourself? Good evening, everyone. My name is Hannah Warner, and I'm an attorney with Columbia Legal Services in our Olympia office. Okay, and I will go back to sharing the PowerPoint. Great, thank you. So we can move to slide 10. Okay, so that, now I'd like to talk uh, about the challenges we faced advocating for House Bill 1412 this past legislative session um, in 2021, as well as some great opportunities uh, that developed. So House Bill 1412 made good progress during the 2021 legislative session, passing out of both the House Policy Committee and the House Appropriations Committee. But unfortunately, the bill was never called to the House floor for a vote. The bill faced significant opposition from the prosecutor's offices, the Washington Association of Prosecuting Attorneys and county governments, collection agencies and insurance companies also testified against the bill. Um, as Prachi um, briefly mentioned, um, these groups were mainly opposed to the provisions in the bill that would allow courts to waive restitution owed to entities like insurance companies, that would allow judges to waive the victim penalty assessment, which is currently mandatory, and that would create limitations on collection of LFO debt so that courts may not try to collect on these LFOs indefinitely. Opponents of the bill also raised concerns about revenue loss. Certain county and court programs are funded through the collection of LFOs. And this creates an unfortunate incentive for local governments to oppose changes to the LFO system. For example, the Washington State Association of Counties testified that if House Bill 1412 were to pass and LFOs were reduced, then local governments would lose substantial revenue. However, the greatest obstacle we encountered did not come from a single stakeholder or group, but was instead a general lack of current data on LFO collection rates. Local governments were not able to give concrete numbers for the revenue they expected to lose if House Bill 1412 were to pass. They merely stated that it would likely be a substantial amount of money. Supporters of the bill uh, argued that the bill would actually have a minimal impact on local budgets because the amount that governments are actually collecting is far smaller than the amounts they're imposing because people simply do not have the ability to pay their LFOs. But without the data to support our arguments, we could not counter the opposition's arguments as effectively as we would have liked. Then as we were waiting for the bill to be called to the House floor for a vote, the Washington State Supreme Court issued its decision in state of Washington v. Blake. Um, and as many of you uh, may know, in Blake, the court struck down Washington's simple possession statute as unconstitutional. As a result of Blake, local governments must resentence certain individuals or vacate their sentences, including refunding the LFOs tied to those vacated convictions. Due to the high fiscal impact that the Blake decision could have on local governments, House leadership ultimately decided not to move forward several bills, including House Bill 1412, that might negatively impact counties' budgets. Out of all these challenges came several opportunities, however. We had very strong allies in the academic and legal community come out in support of the bill. For example, this evening you heard the testimony from Dr. Alexis Harris and Dr. Karen Martin. And the Superior Court Judges Association advocated strongly for House Bill 1412 throughout the entire legislative process. 
directly impacted individuals, including currently and formerly incarcerated folks and folks with lived experience of LFO debt, were able to provide powerful testimony in support, of, in support of House Bill 1412 and the need to reform our harsh LFO system. Members of the community testified remotely uh, from various locations in support of House Bill 1412 before the House Civil Rights and Judiciary Committee this past February. And we'll hopefully hear from some of these outstanding advocates later on this evening. And then finally, we were also able to identify the existing gaps in the data on LFOs, and we successfully pushed for a study on LFOs to be funded through the state budget to provide us with the data that's missing that we need to support future advocacy. Can you move to the next slide, please? Um, so next, I'd like to share a little bit more about the LFO study, which we view as a great win uh, that we achieved um, in the final budget process at the end of last session. And so this budget proviso allocates $200,000 in funding for the Washington State Institute for Public Policy, or WISIP, to gather various data on LFOs, including LFO collection rates. The proviso also directs WISIP to provide recommendations to the legislature on how to provide local funding through means other than through the collection of LFOs. So the study should recommend ways to de-link funding for the courts and for other county and local programs from the collection of LFOs. And the proviso also directs WISIP to solicit input from various stakeholders during the course of the study, including counties, prosecutors, judges, civil legal aid, academia, and importantly, people who are currently or formerly incarcerated. Uh, we will receive an initial report uh, in December 2021, and the final report will be coming in December 2022. We're excited because this study will keep momentum on the bill moving forward into next session, and most importantly, uh, we hope it will provide us with valuable data that we can use during our ongoing advocacy efforts. In particular, we hope to receive data to support our argument that reducing LFOs will likely not result in the significant loss of revenue to local governments. And next slide, please. And so uh, looking ahead to, to next session in 2022, uh, we will likely have two legislative vehicles with which uh, we can hopefully advance our LFO reform efforts. And so first, uh, we will likely be advocating for 1412 in the House again. And we also have a companion bill in the Senate, Senate Bill 5486, sponsored by Senator Sheldon. We will likely be pushing for both of these bills next session. Um, and as we continue preparing for 2022, we'll continue to have conversations with stakeholders and to engage on the LFO study, including helping to connect the study researchers with currently and formerly incarcerated individuals so that they can provide input. And this year, we have the opportunity to take the time to build a strong coalition with impacted community members. By building a stronger, broader coalition, directly impacted community advocates can become more closely engaged in the legislative process, share their stories with legislators, and together we can push for stronger LFO policies. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. And we're going to do a quick break. Um, and then we'll, when we get, come back from in five minutes, We'll hear some more from Rep. Simmons. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Um, I've put in the chat uh, links to the surveys. There's one in English and one in Spanish. Again, as was kind of men mentioned in some of the previous um, presentations, it's going to take all of us to be able to move this bill forward. Um, so if you want to be part of that process, um, please fill out the survey. And um, we're going to let uh, Representative Simmons talk just a little bit more. And then we're going to hear from um, Amber to talk a little bit more of a personal story related to that. So go ahead, Tara. Thank you, Kelly. Um, I just want to say before we move on, I'm really grateful for Hannah. I, I don't see her face here again, but... If it wasn't for Hannah, I definitely would have never thought to ask for the budget proviso for the study, um, which is gonna help us um, combat the narrative around the loss of revenue and how much we're really collecting. My hope is that the study really shows that we're spending dollars to chase dimes. We are, the counties are paying the county clerks um, salaries, they're sending out money and postage uh, to try and collect these LFOs. And I guarantee when we get good data, I, I'm very hopeful we're gonna show that they're actually spending more 
um, in collection efforts and enforcement than they are collecting in revenue. So thank you again, Hannah, um, for your brilliant um, uh, strategy to get that study. Um, with that said, I, I'm I'm sad that it, you know we're just gonna have a preliminary report in December, but I am fully committed to getting this through this session. It's my top priority. Um, and as a new member, we kind of get to um, tell our leadership what our priorities are. Last year, it was the voting rights bill, um, which we got through and was one of the first that the governor signed. And that's because that was you know pretty baked and we had a good coalition um, and people were working really hard during the interim. And so this year, I'm hopeful that um, you know making this my number one bill. Also, you know, having a Republican senator um, introduce a bill, a companion, is really a huge win too. Um, and I just wanted to tell you how that happened. Is you know, an impacted person came to Kelly's impacted caucus group where they're talking about all these different bills, and like it, within a week, she was on the front page or you know, with it in the Seattle Times, and found out that her relative is Senator Sheldon and he called me um, just in tears and he tried so hard to get my leadership to, to vote our bill off the House floor at the last minute, the last day. Um, and, you know, so I think having his support, um, you, you know, because often it's unfortunate that we do operate in a like partisan world. I don't think this should be partisan, but not one Republican voted for it in um, the Civil Rights and Judiciary or the Appropriations Committee. And so I'm hopeful having his support and his leadership. Um, at the end of the day, I don't care which bill gets through. It doesn't need to be my bill. I really want the relief for our community. Um, so I'm gonna support him and hopefully he'll, he'll be a better messenger um, than me, you know? Um, and, and so this is a huge uh, priority for me. I don't wanna wait for the final report from WISA because I think that's going to give us even more ideas. Like I said, my vision is to completely get rid of LFOs in our state. And we've been working towards that for you know a decade. Uh, and I know there's going to be more that needs to happen. And so my hope is that we get this through and then take the WISP study and, and create our, our next bill. Um, and I also want to you know, thank Judge David Keenan, who's on the call, because um, oftentimes, you know, having judges support us is really going to be powerful with some people who aren't sympathetic to our lived experiences and our stories. Um, and so having the support from the judicial commissions and committees is really important. And I know Judge Keenan has been working really hard to make that happen. Um, but what we also really need is more impacted people and more community advocates and so I'll tell you, as you know, a, a freshman legislator, um, one of the things that really matters is like how many emails people get um, on a bill. And so if your organization has access to um, you, you know, a, a mailing list and can get people, I'm looking at Jamie Hawk in the ACLU um, and, and CLS, I know, uh, you know, can generate a lot of community support from activists. Um, to generate emails that make members know that this is a priority. Um, we did get a lot of movement in members calling me at the last minute asking me what's going on with this bill, um, but we needed to do that sooner. It's going to be a short session, 60 days, um, but I am going to um, be strategizing very quickly on when this will be heard in the Senate Law and Justice Committee and also what it's going to take to get the vote off of the House floor from the House um, leadership. So I hope that all of you will join us in this effort because we do need all of you and then some. So thank you. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce Amber Letchworth with Ida the Time. Welcome, Amber. Thank you, Kelly. And thank you everyone for your presentations. I know we've had a lot of audio uh, issues. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, okay, great. Uh, so yeah, everyone, um, my name's Amber Letchworth, um, formerly incarcerated woman. I have been in my community um, out of confinement since 2014. Um, uh, I've been, I was gracefully enough, uh, I found, I did the time my first week out, and this was uh, one of the first bills that we worked on back in, in 2014, um, uh, was House Bill 17, 
was it 1783? Um, and you know, I think that we can see by everyone's presentations today that um, that legislation isn't always cut and dry. Um, we do have to make a lot of concessions, and sometimes, um, you know, it, that's that's the price we pay to move forward. Um, and I just uh, I, I love the the engagement that we have, um, and that we're able to communicate in these realms now, right? In the the power of Zoom. Who knows how many uh, if we would have had to make any concessions if we had Zoom back then, right? Um, so, so just really grateful um, for the mediums that we're, we're able to communicate in. Um, I just, uh, a lot of, you know, what, what Representative Simmons was sharing, um, I, I just really want to, uh, to speak to that, you know, um, when she was talking about being faced with that, that choice, you know, when you're, when you're out in your community and you can't pay all these fines, you can't even afford shoes for your kids, you know, how many people end up falling back into that cycle of, of criminal activity or, you know, um, uh, just to, just to get by. And so, um, so my story, uh, when I first got out, I was, um, I did get to, sorry, it's been really weird, uh, like sweaty in this room. So, um, I don't, I have even worse internet at my house. So I stayed, I stayed behind at the office today. Um, uh, I just remember that the low wage job that I was able to secure, um, I, I would pay all my bills and all the minimum payments on my LFOs and my cost of supervision and, um, you know, my bus passes and all these things. And I would have $13 left over at the end of the month. And I, I just remember, you know, barely being able to afford to eat and, you know, and you have to pay those LFOs because back then they could jail you for failure to pay. And so what that would look like for me was I was released to a different county because I didn't have any good supports um, back, you know, in my hometown. And so I would have, I, you know, I would have lost my job. I would have, you know, I would have had to ride ride the chain all the way down to my county, you know, that could have taken a week or so to be, to see a judge and be released and, and brought back. And so um, I just, I've really, I really felt a lot of the, the weight that this has carried, you know, and the, and the compounding trauma um, over the years. And so I'm just really grateful for the reform work uh, that we're all able to do here today. Um, uh, and I also wanted to talk about my husband's LFOs. Um, I met and married my husband in recovery, and he came equipped with $300,000 in LFOs. And so in our early, um, uh, in our early, oh, let me tell you a little bit about his story. Um, so he's an Iraqi war veteran. Um, and uh, so, you know, coming back from, from Iraq was really, traumatizing for him. Um, five of his platoon members committed suicide. Um, he struggled with his mental health and that morphed into an addiction, as you can imagine. He was homeless and committed crimes out of desperation and, and really struggling with trauma and, and coming back. And so um, he fell into the justice system, you know, as many of us did. Um, and through a very complicated and convoluted process, he became, um, we all, we, our family became responsible for this $300,000 in debt. Um, the interest on this is so astronomical that we can't even pay it down. We never see this balance go down and it only goes up. And as Nick Allen was giving his presentation, I was kind of crunching some numbers. Um, our family is only able to make the minimum payments. So uh, that's anywhere from $25 to $100 a month. Um, and so uh, year to date after, you know, paying on that, uh, I think we've only paid less than $7,000. And, and like I said, we, we pay that before we eat. Um, even if we were able to pay the $300 a month, uh, it, after 25 years of payments, we would only have paid $90,000 of that debt down. And so it's just, you know, when we think about does the punishment fit the crime, um, there, there's just no way that anyone can justify this. And so um, when we were first growing our family, this could have been the difference between renting a bigger apartment and, um, but instead our son was forced to sleep on the couch and our baby was in a bassinet uh, next to our bed. Um, and so, yeah, after all the good faith payments, um, I'm confident that after we pass this bill, uh, then we'll, you know, maybe get this reviewed, this debt reviewed by a judge. Oh, the, the, it's owed to an insurance company. Um, and so that you know, we're just really excited to um, add this extra component to where we can um, add that judicial discretion that we all need, right? Um, and I'm really excited about uh, expanding the indigency standard because I, you know, I've been doing a lot of the the motions um, and helping people 
craft their financial declarations and get their um, supporting documents. As anyone who's doing this work knows that um, all of the LFO relief that we're able to see has fallen onto you know, us uh, in the civil legal aid or, or in the community organizer um, positions. And um, what even though that people don't necessarily meet the indigency standard, um, we are working poor. Uh, we are spending every penny that we make. Um, and I know that it doesn't always fit, you know, into the these nice forms. So I'm just excited about uh, where this advocacy is going, um, and uh, and headed towards getting rid of LFOs altogether. And yeah, I know that Kelly wanted to share her story too. So I'm done stuttering for now. <laughs> Go ahead, Kelly. Thanks, Hannah. Um, just I'm just going to be really quick. Just um, the the burden and just the. Um, stress of having LFOs weighing over you is really, really overwhelming. And the other thing that I just want to add just from doing this work and knowing people is that it's also um, throughout our state, different counties um, operate in different ways, right? And so I know people that are in certain counties that are hounded a lot more than others. And so, so we have a really kind of broken system throughout our counties too. Um, I also have a large amount of restitution that is owed and um, and yeah, it's, it's a huge burden. You cannot, as we talked a little bit earlier, um, you cannot vacate your record or do anything like that until you've actually been able to pay off your LFOs. Um, and so I'm excited to work on this bill. Uh, our time has been going by really fast. And so I know there was one question in particular. Um, I'm not sure, I'm thinking either Nick or our Rep Simmons or even Prachi can answer this, um, but there was a question about do the counties sell the debt um, to, to collections? I think was, oh no. yeah, do counties sell these debts to financial businesses? Can anybody talk about the selling of the debt? Um, I, I, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I don't know what the audio. Um, the the answer is uh, no. Um, that the LFOs aren't sold to financial businesses. They can be. Uh, they can transfer uh, collection authority to uh, collection agencies, but the court still retains uh, jurisdiction over the debts. Um, so even if it's with a collection agency, the court still has control over that debt. Um, it's it's not like a true what you'd call like an assignment of debt. Um, and and the 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 debts aren't sold to to private businesses. Thank you, Nick. Other questions. I don't know that I saw other questions in the chat. Um, we did put the survey in there. Um, that's how we're going to be collecting information to um, have further sessions and to kind of build the coalition and start to strategize. Um, on doing outreach and kind of building a whole campaign around this. Um, and like I said, we're going to need as many people as we can um, helping us kind of stand behind that. Um, so other questions? No? Yeah, actually, I have a question. I don't know if anybody has addressed, this is kind of um, a little bit like divergence from the actual LFO and like resentencing. Um, once somebody gets their LFOs or their, their case resentenced, does that come back up as somebody who now has a conviction in 2021? And how does that negatively impact somebody when they're when an old case um, gets like like they get some justice on on getting a case resentenced, but then it looks like a fresh conviction. In the record. Um, I'm going to look to either Nick or Prachi. Um, I don't think it, it's not going to affect the conviction date. Was that what the question was? Yeah, the resentencing does it does it like re Oh the resentencing. Yeah. So I Nick or Prachi. I see Prachi on mic. 
Yeah, so sorry. So you're saying that there is a uh, case in which there was a conviction, there was some request for relief when it comes to resentencing that had nothing to do with the LFOs. And is the question, how does that resentencing impact the LFO relief that the person might be entitled to? I'm just trying to make sure I have the right question. I think the question was, if you get, re I think it was separate from the LFOs, and correct me if I'm wrong, Tanya, um, that if you get resentenced, does your conviction date then become 2021? Like if you you got resentenced from something in 2010, so this was not necessarily related to the LFOs, but is that, am I interpreting that right? Yes, thank you, yes. I think Taya, this um, this is probably a really good question for us to maybe connect on individually. And so, if you want to get in touch with me, I can make sure that you have my contact information so we can talk through some of the questions and the issues with respect to the question that you posed. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Okay, and then there was a question in the chat by Evan. Um, for the advocacy work by folks who are impacted by LFO payments, will people's experiences be documented for advocates who are seeking to bring awareness to the topic? Um, I do know that Civil Survival is working on a video. Um, and so, um, so yes, I think that we're doing, um, we definitely want to have some personal stories. There are some other organizations then out there that are also doing some things, but we definitely need to build those personal stories um, as part of the education and outreach. And also a huge shout out to Amber today. Um, she shared more of her story and just kind of, uh, um, you know, it is really challenging for those of us who have been formerly incarcerated. We typically have a lot of trauma and once we start to talk about our convictions, it's really accessing a part of our trauma that can be really hard to talk about. And so, and uh, I see Amber smiling, but I know there's, you know, I, it's been, I got out of prison in 2007 and I still sometimes will go to tell my story and just break down in tears. Um, so, you know, huge shout out, any of the people who are directly impacted, um, we do need your stories. And I just wanna also, acknowledge that um, it is really hard to put your story out there and you can sometimes have your story used against you. So uh, I think we're just about done. Is there any last messages that anybody wants to share or say? Yeah, I see Repson's adding, if anybody has skills creating short videos, that would be good. And thanks for sharing uh, in the chat too, Michelle. Um, okay, well, I think that we'll go ahead and end here. We were scheduled to end at 6.30 and we appreciate everybody for coming out tonight and just stay tuned. We'll continue to push this work forward. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you, everyone.